Welcome back, everybody. We are starting week two of our AP Calculus BC AP exam prep for the 2021 exam. So last week, I hope you were able to join us. We have four uh, really good videos on high leverage topics on the BC exam. We talked about Taylor series. We talked about polar graphs. We talked about parametrics and all of those integration techniques. And then this week, we're going to finish off those major topics uh, with four more videos that Tony and I feel really confident are going to give you a big amount of points, right? We're going to make sure that you get that five on that exam that you've been wanting for all year. All the hard work you put in all year is going to pay off with these next four videos as long as as well as the previous four videos. So uh, follow along today, because today we're talking about another highly important topic. And we're gonna be discussing this idea of differential equations and the idea of logistic differential equations and logistics curves. So these are two things that are uh, always gonna be on the Calc BC exam. And they always look a little bit different at first if you're not used to them. But if you know a few of the tricks and a little bit of the insider information of how the exam is gonna ask questions, as well as what we need to put on the paper to get all those points on the exam, uh, you're gonna leave here today uh, with a whole bunch more points and one step closer to a five on the exam. So in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, Tony and I are gonna be just giving you points. We're just gonna be racking up points, uh, point after point after point uh, to get you ready for the exam. So I am of course joined by my good friend, Tony. Uh, from Avon High School. And Tony's going to be walking us through uh, not just what we're learning today, but what are the big ideas that you have to know to get all these points on the AP exam? So Tony, number one, how are you doing today? And number two, what do we got to learn? Well, number one, I'm doing great, Brian. I hope you're doing well too. We've got some great weather surrounding us here in the Midwest. And uh, we're also getting pretty excited as we get down to the nitty gritty closer to AP exam time. What is it that we're going to learn? Well, as Brian mentioned, we're going to examine differential equations and logistics. So it's a little bit of BC with a little bit of AB sprinkled in there as well. But the key ingredients to this wonderful dish can really be found on this slide right here. And so it's very important that you're pretty confident with these ideas. If you're wanting to take a really quick screen capture of this with your phone or what have you, feel right, feel free to go ahead and, and do that. But pretty much in all the problems that we're gonna talk about in this broadcast, we're gonna mention everything in these six rows. So it starts off with the general form of the logistic differential equation. It just goes with the territory. There are certain things in mathematics that we just have to memorize. And this is going to be uh, serving you quite well. Notice there are two forms of this. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we don't mean for these K values. I know it seems like, well, wait a minute, how's this possible? These two K values, they can't be equal. Well, they're not supposed to be equal, but these are two very legitimate forms of the differential uh, equation with the logistic characteristics. Sometimes we have the L located all by his lonesome self in that particular fraction. Other times that L is out in front of that binomial. We also know the L is this idea called the carrying capacity. Those of you who've taken AP bio, you might be thinking, hey, I've heard of that word. It's great when you see two different AP courses merged together like that. But the limit of your population as your time goes on forever, is going to reach this carrying capacity. Fastest growth rate, extremely important. Take that carrying capacity, chop it in half, and that's when you're going to be growing the fastest for this particular model. We've got a couple of uh, very interesting relationships that focus on the second derivative of that population curve Y. If that second derivative is positive, obviously we have a curve that's concave up. That's going to happen prior to getting to that point, that special point of inflection, if you will, where it's half the carrying capacity. And then if you have a negative second derivative, that's beyond that halfway point of the carrying capacity for your downward concavity. And then of course, increasing behavior will happen all the time. Your first derivative is going to be positive. Your curve is increasing because we don't call it logistic growth for nothing. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at an example. Our FRQ1 starts with perhaps a, a common occurrence for some of you just a year ago. After completing the 2020 AP exam, students uploaded their responses to be scored. We're going to let E represent the total number of AP calculus responses in thousands that have been uploaded T minutes after testing is completed. At time t equal 10, 75,000 responses have been uploaded, and we know that e prime of 10 is 18. And you can see we can ask 
a lot of different things here. And I'm going to start off with our part A. Write an equation of the line tangent to the graph of E at t equal 10. And we're going to use this tangent line to approximate E of 13. Well, you think about the ingredients that you need to write the equation of a tangent line. It's probably something that you've done more than once. Heck, it's probably something that you've done more than 25 times during your time in your calculus class. So we definitely need a slope and we need a point. And we know that that slope is found by using calculus, right? That's what the derivative does. And so we're interested in where that is uh, uh, happening at time 10. And we're told in the stem of the problem that our slope is 18. So we can just refer to that as our slope if you want. And then if you read a little bit more, it does say at time 10, 75,000 responses have been scored. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say that our E of 10 is 75. Now I want to keep it kind of important in the back of my mind that this is in terms of thousands. We certainly had more than 75 students upload an exam at that point, hopefully. And so we can always come back to that label at the end. Now, I know some of you are really comfortable with X's and Y's. I'll tell you what, I am too. It's totally okay. If you want to use the idea of point slope formula with X's and Y's, we'll do that for the time being. Y minus, that should be 75. That would equal your slope 18, quantity x minus 10. And then, of course, you could solve this for y pretty easy. But I want you to make a deal with yourself, with me, with Brian. Let's be a little bit more sophisticated. Let's communicate this mathematics a little bit more in tune with what the problem is mentioning. In other words, this y, that's really our E, that's the number of exams, right? And it's a function of T, of course. And of course, this X is a value of time T. So what we could do is we could just simply add the 75 over to the right side, and then we could add the quantity 18 times T minus 10. And I would say, we've got a model, right? We have the equation of the tangent line to the graph of E at T equal 10. Looks good. But there is one other piece that we want to recognize, and that is approximate what E of 13 is going to be. OK, now this E of T is truly an approximation, so it might be a little bit more sound communication to recognize that. That's sort of the drawback of using the E of T. And so if we say, all right, well, we want E at time 13, this would be 13 minutes after the submission portal opens, we just simply toss our 13 in for T. And if you stop right here, yes, you would earn full credit. You would earn credit because you have a numerical answer. If you wanted to take this a little bit farther, 75 plus 18 times three is what? 75 plus, oh boy, I'm on the spot here. 75 plus 18 times three, it's like 129. But again, it's something that you wouldn't necessarily have to do in this problem. If you want to really dress this up nicely, we could throw that thousand back in here. And that's the number of uploads that would be completed at time 13. If we move on to part D, we've got a young man. Your angel believes that E can be modeled by the logistic equation Y equal R of T. And we're told what this uh, derivative is. The, the the derivative of the uh, r of t is h 25ths r quantity 1 minus r over 300. And we know that r of 10 is 75 again. According to this model, what is the rate in thousands of responses per minute at the moment when responses are uploaded fastest? This is where some of that conceptual pieces come into play for the logistic differential equation. What we would have to do is immediately recognize that this sentence here, or this equation, is definitely our logistic form. It's one of our two forms. In fact, it's the one that has our carrying capacity right down there at the bottom, 300. And so we latch onto that. We realize that if we were to visualize this graphically, it's likely that this curve might look something like this per se to start. And we know that it has the ceiling up here at 300. Hey, let me extend that uh, axis a little bit. So we know that that's going to happen. But more importantly for part B, 
we know that half of that carrying capacity is going to occur at 150. And then we also know that that is where those uploads are happening the fastest. Basically, if you think about the slope drawn to this curve, you're not going to get any steeper tangent line than at that particular point. And so we kind of connect all of that together and we have to figure out, well, okay, well, what does that really mean in the, in the context of this problem? And well, we would say that 150, that would be the value of, of, our, of our R, right? The number of uploads. And so if we go back to this DRDT, and if I plug in this 150 for that R, we would have something like this, 8 25ths times 150, quantity 1 minus 150 over 300. Now, we are looking at a uh, non-calculator problem here, so this one should be uh, easy to clean up if we, if we ch so chose to do so. But at this point, if we read this question, I think that we've answered what we need to answer. According to this model, what is the rate? the rate in thousands of responses. And so we have indeed solved for our rate. Our DRDT is expressed as a numeric quantity. Um, if you do want to simplify this, it works out really nicely as 24. And again, if you want, you could either write the word thousand, you could put three zeros after it. Um, it is the rate. So we're not talking about responses, but we're talking more about responses per time, which in this case would be in minutes. Of course, the, the label was already uh, presented to us in the question, so you wouldn't necessarily be required to put it in your answer, but it never hurts to throw that in there to be a little bit more thorough with your communication. We are going to hand it over to my friend Brian. He's going to finish up FRQ1 for you. Thanks, Tony. So we're going to take a little twist here and go to uh, part C. And I hope what you see today with these FRQs, um, we have two of them, and we're not going to do all of both of them, right? So we're going to do three parts on uh, FRQ1, and we'll look at three parts on FRQ number two. So you're going to have a couple of extra pieces that you can take home and, and practice, uh, as well as a couple of the multiple choice that we won't get to. And, you know, Tony, real quick, one of the most uh, common things we've noticed on the Google form, right? There's a little Google feedback form if you have questions or things from the, after the videos. Uh, is how do we get the answer keys? How do we get the solution keys? That's always the, the number one thing everybody wants to know. So uh, I believe that all of the keys from week one's videos are now posted with the documents in the Google Drive. And then we will continue to post the keys each day uh, we won't post them necessarily the same day uh, because a lot of teachers and students would like to have a chance to do them on their own first and then wait a day uh, before you're able to, ha to have the keys. But uh, start looking for those keys the day after we uh, have our, our video series. So you can at least compare your answers and see not just what the answers are, but uh, what should the solution look like, right? What kind of work do you want on the paper? What would like an exemplary answer be like? Uh, so we're not just getting right answers, but we're also using good notation and we're showing enough evidence of our work uh, to get all of those points. And Tony's been very kind. Tony's been typing up all the, the answer keys uh, for me. And uh, some of our good friends have been uh, checking our keys and checking our work and making sure that we get most of our mistakes cleaned up before we go live on the air each day. Um, so here's part C, right? So we're going to turn it a little bit. And we have a new model, right, uh, that Yo Angel figured out. Shout out to Yo Angel, one of my students. Um, but we have this new model. Uh, that you angel had that was logistic and we want to know is the rate that responses are uploaded increasing or decreasing when t is 10 right so notice here we have this idea of a rate and we see this word of increasing or decreasing and sometimes there's a lot of confusion on the exam or some misconceptions that usually happen when students take uh, not enough time to think about a question first you see words like rate and your brain thinks derivative good you see words like increasing, decreasing, and you think derivative. And so what happens is we just see those words and we always think derivative. So we just start plugging stuff into the derivative and thinking that we're gonna have an answer. However, uh, we're asking if the rate, right? Remember the rate is that dr over dt. That's the rate, right? We're given that rate equation. I wanna know if this rate is increasing or decreasing. And so to figure out if a rate is increasing or decreasing, 
or to figure out if anything is increasing or decreasing, we have to check the sign of its derivative. Any function is increasing on an interval where its derivative is greater than or equal to zero. And so in theory, we would have to find the second derivative to find out if the rate itself is increasing or decreasing. However, because this is logistic, rather than taking the second derivative, which we'll, we'll do that a little bit later on in the video of a different problem, if you know something's logistic, we can use a lot of that uh, ideas that Tony mentioned, right? So this is a, a potential picture of what a logistic differential curve might look like. So, so this is going to be a, a growth equation. And this is not the derivative. This is the solution curve. And so we're starting kind of at zero and we're uploading exams. We get to that carrying capacity that Tony mentioned, that L value of, of the maximum number of exams. And we mentioned in that table that uh, the carrying capacity is going to be you know, L and the function will be always increasing and it's going to be concave up or it's going to be increasing at an increasing rate all the way until we get to that halfway point of the carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity uh, is going to allow us to get that um, the, the maximum height. But if we get halfway to the carrying capacity, then we know that we're going to be at that moment when it's growing the fastest. And so the rate is going to be increasing everywhere up until that moment, right? So this first part of the curve the rate is always increasing because uh, the graph is concave up. The second derivative is positive. But then after that fastest moment, once you get to that halfway point of the height, our, our curve is still increasing, our solution is, but it will be increasing at a decreasing rate. And so rather than taking the second derivative, if we just understood what the carrying capacity was, we could figure out immediately whether or not this thing is concave up or concave down. And uh, based on that little table that Tony shared in the beginning, this is one of those formulas, right? Understanding the general form of a logistic differential equation. And we're kind of looking at this first form here. And so we look down here, right? At this bottom, our carrying capacity was 300, like Tony mentioned, which means that half of that is 150. So I know that this curve, no matter what, will be concave up all the way till it gets to 150 and then it's going to be concave down from that point on. And we're checking at time 10. And we already know at time 10, the number of responses, E of 10, was simply 75. And so since we're not quite to that carrying capacity, not quite to that halfway point, right? Our halfway point, uh, L over two in this case is 150. So I know that everything up to 150,000 responses will be increasing at an increasing rate. And 75 is still below that. So we know that in this case, the rate is increasing and it's increasing because of the properties of logistic differential equations right and so when you see this kind of question probably not going to show up quite like this on an frq and the reason why is because what kind of work we want a student to show right if you're using logistic properties and understandings you may not have any work you might just understand that if you're not quite to the halfway point of carrying capacity we're still on that concave up part. So we're still increasing at an increasing rate. Whereas once you get past the halfway point, you're now increasing at a decreasing rate. And there's not a whole lot there, but this would certainly show up on like a multiple choice question, understanding the properties of the graphs and, and that, that halfway point, how important that is, is gonna be a really good um, thing to understand. So the rate is increasing and it says, give a reason for your answer. We could have taken the second derivative and shown some work, but we could say um, that 75, I'm just going to use some odd notation for a second, is less than 150, right? And so since the carrying capacity, and you might say L if you wanted to, but since the carrying capacity is 300, the function R will be increasing at an increasing rate. So that means the rate itself is also increasing when R is less than 150. So any Y values or any R values in this case, less than 150, our function will be increasing at an increasing rate. So understanding the properties will really save you some time, especially on some of these multiple choice questions. We're not gonna look at part D for free response one, but I'm just gonna show it to you. Um, it's a different, model, right? We have a couple different models. We've had this tangent line approximation. We've had this um, logistic equation. Now we have our differential equation, exponential growth. Uh, this is definitely an A-B topic as well. 
We're going to leave this one out. Sorry, Emma, your problem won't be done, but we're going to see a very similar example to this in FRQ2 that Tony will work out. So we'll have a chance, or maybe I'll work it out. I can't remember who's working this one out, but we'll figure it out. Um, but we're going to see this a similar example. So we'll leave this one for you, uh, a, a new model. So with that said, let's transition over to FRQ number two. So here is our second example, and I'm going to look at part A, and Tony's going to look at the couple more parts before we get to multiple choice. So FRQ2, I kind of had fun writing this question because it gave me a chance to kind of mix some things together that I'm pretty sure uh, that you haven't ever seen mixed together. And whether or not it'll be on the AP exam this way or not is, is not the important part. It's more about understanding we're connecting all these ideas together. All the things we've learned in calculus are one big idea, right? And so if we can start to see how things that don't seem that in the surface are paired together, but they could be, it really shows a good understanding. So you know you'll be ready for whatever the exam throws at you. So here we have this uh, equation where the number of cars that have exited a parking garage can be modeled by the function y equals L of t, which satisfies the differential equation, uh, 2 over 15 times 280 minus 2L. At time zero, there's 435 cars in the garage and no cars have exited. So it looks kind of like one of those rate in, rate out problems we, we do a lot in calculus. But at the same time, it's a differential equation, right? So we have this kind of rate out, but differential equation version of it. And so it's going to be kind of an interesting uh, twist. So we're going to go ahead and, and, and sketch the solution curve, which is a pretty common question on the AP exam. If you happen to be taking the digital online version, like the third administration, uh, you will not have to sketch any slope fields or solution curves uh, in the online version. But if you're doing paper and pencil uh, for the first two administrations, the one that's coming up next week, can't believe it's only a week away, or the one uh, in later May, right, the two May dates, um, you certainly could have to you know, sketch a solution curve or sketch a slope field. So we're going to take a look at that solution curve, and then Tony's going to solve the problem for us. And then we're going to see kind of a nice little connection to rate in, rate out uh, problems with a twist, I think. So part A just says, let's just sketch the solution curve. And when they ask you to sketch the solution curve, they're asking you to, to you know, basically graph what the solution looks like. When you're given a slope field, those are a bunch of slopes. And there's a lot of different families, right? There's a whole family of curves. Um, so we want the specific one through zero, zero. So if they ever ask you to sketch a solution curve, the number one rule is make sure it goes through the point, right? It's got to touch the point zero, zero. So uh, whatever point they give you, make sure that your, your graph goes through that point. If the dot is on the paper already for you, make sure your line goes through it. If you miss it like a tiny bit, you better make that point really big. It's the world's biggest point. It goes from zero dimensions to like a massive dimension, but you've got to make sure you go through the point. So what else do we want to know about sketching solution curves? Well, number one, if you're sketching a solution curve, remember a solution to a differential equation must be a function. So it can't start wrapping back around itself, right? So if it's kind of like a, a circular type graph and you start like, wait a minute, if I keep following this, I'm going to go back around, it's not a function. You have to stop once it no longer as a function and end it right there. Number two, our solutions have to be continuous. So if there ever does happen to be like a vertical asymptote or something like that happening, once you reach the asymptote, you have to stop also. You can't keep going on the other side of the asymptote because we don't actually know if the graph keeps going or not. It looks like it does, we have no idea without more information. So those two big ideas are the two big things. Make sure you keep a function, Make sure that your function is continuous if you have something, and then always go to the very edge of the graph if you can. Never stop short of the end of the picture, uh, unless for some reason there's like a discontinuity or an asymptote or something. So in this case, we're starting at zero, zero. We're trying to follow this, this path of these slopes. And from following the path of the slopes, the best recommendation I think you could have is just imagine it's like a current of an ocean. It's kind of guiding you. and I have found that the, the faster you draw your solution curve, the better your graph is. The more you try to like get it exactly right to match all those slopes, the more like, you know, non-smooth it looks and you end up like in kind of a weird picture, but you just have to feel it, right? Just kind of go for it. Just say, okay, I can see a pattern here. What, what's the pattern look like? And you'll notice it's kind of like this horizontal asymptote here. You can kind of see this horizontal line, you know, sort of right here going across the screen. That was that carry capacity. That's why we weren't able to get any higher than that. So notice we started at zero, zero. I didn't keep going backwards because it wouldn't make any sense, right? The graph starts at zero, zero. We can't have negative amount of cars. So we're going to kind of leave it there. 
we have this domain where t is greater than or equal to 30. So I can't go backwards, we'd have negative time and the problem restricts it. And then we also have this idea of we're going all the way to the edge of the graph and then we're hitting it there, right? So don't use arrows. We're not really fans of arrows because the arrows indicate it goes in that exact direction forever. And sometimes it's not quite true. We don't always know. So uh, we would leave our solution curve like that. So Tony is now gonna take this idea of a solution curve and walk us through how could we take this idea and then solve it and then get some other cool questions, I think. Hopefully you'll like them. Sounds great. Yes, if you remember that really awesome solution curve that Brian just sketched for you in part A, well, part B is all about finding its equation. So we're gonna use this idea, separation of variables to find the particular solution, y equals L of t to that differential equation um, above with this initial condition, L of zero, zero. This is the holy grail of points often on the AP Calc exam free response section. Typically these problems in recent exams can be worth as many as five points. Five of the nine points in this overall FRQ can be devoted to just this part. And so we're gonna start with this idea, separation of variables. What that means is if we revisit our differential equation up here, we're thinking, hey, we've got the variable L, we've got the variable T, let's separate them. And so we're gonna to want to let the L's occupy the left side, right? Because by virtue of the DL being on top of this left-hand fraction, that's gonna indicate that our L's are gonna be on the left side. Now, the 280 minus 2L is the expression that you see that contains an L on the right side, but you have to think of it as a package deal. That will travel together, the 280 and the negative 2L won't ever find themselves separate. They're joined at the hip, so to speak. So we're going to go ahead and divide this whole expression, 280 minus 2L over to the left side. And he will join his friend DL. And at which point that denominator DT will move over to the right side. We'll just multiply it over. And we have finally variables that are separated. Now, don't start worrying about, wait a minute, I don't have a lowercase t. I don't have a little t variable. It's OK. Sometimes we might have that independent variable present. Sometimes we don't. We can still integrate and solve. And that brings us to the next phase. We are going to take the antiderivative of both sides. Left side, a little bit tricky. It is a natural log form. There's no denying that we get the natural log of the absolute value of 280 minus 2 times L. But it also involves a substitution. Because of this L, not only having the 2 value coefficient in front, but that negative as well, or that minus sign, we're going to have to think of a U substitution in here. The derivative of this denominator is hopefully you could see is negative two. And as we've talked about in a previous video, we're gonna to have to flip that guy upside down to sort of offset that constant value that we need. The right side, when we integrate two, under, uh, two over 15 with respect to t, just gives us two over 15 times t. Now you might think the constants, well, we could put the constants on both sides, but we're eventually going to want to push them over to one of the sides only. And we choose the right side here because it's going to make things a little bit easier uh, for us to work. At this point, it's very likely you would have earned two points. You typically earn one point if you're able to separate the variables correctly. And then you're able to earn a second point with your first line of integration. Now, what we're going to do is go after the C value. We don't want this C value hanging around, cluttering up our problem, being, being all elusive, being so kind of sus, right? We want this C to be known. And that's where the initial condition comes into play. So we're going to use the fact that T is zero when L is zero. That's basically just the ordered pair, T comma L. And that's going to help us find the C. Let's watch how that happens. We plug zero in for L. And essentially what that's going to do is wipe out this two times L. And so I have the natural log of 280. Well, the last time I checked, 280 was positive, right? So we really don't need to put absolute values around this anymore if, if we so chose. And then if we let the T be zero, it's gonna wipe all of this away. And then before you know it, you've already found your value of C and you've earned a third point. Just the action of 
trying to use this initial condition to find the C is going to be the third point typically. So where are we? Let's, let's kind of like recap. We took this original result of integrating this differential equation that we separated, and we have negative one half natural log absolute value of 280 minus 2L equivalent to 2 fifteenths T. And then we get to put this beautiful looking C in here, minus one half natural log of 280. Well, that's a beautiful looking C. Now, before we go on, some of you might be, well, wait a minute, my, 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 my teacher didn't do it like this. It's totally okay if you choose to solve for L first. I know a lot of teachers that do that. I show students in my classroom both ways. I typically allow them just to pick, but I, I do ask that they kind of stick to that particular method so that they can become. But if you do solve for L first, I want to warn you, you won't quite get the same C, but don't panic. Everything is fine. Your final solution is going to come out to be the same as whether you did one method over the other. So speaking of which, we're about ready to finish this up. We need to read these directions carefully. And it says, find the solution y equal L of t. That implies that your L of t is by itself. So we do need to solve this for L. And that's just a little bit of algebra manipulation here. One of the first things that I would suggest is any stray coefficient out in front of the left side, especially if the left side has a natural logarithm, it has to go. So we're going to multiply both sides by negative 2. And so when we do that, the right side becomes negative 4 fifteenths times t. And we catch a little break here. When we multiply negative half times 2, we just get positive natural log of 280. Everything's looking good. We're on our way, except we now need to get the L alone. That means we have to get this L. It's called exponentiating both sides. We're going to use base E, and we're going to go ahead and know that this E and the LN will sort of do away with one another. And we end up with the absolute value of 280 minus 2L. And then over on the right side, we can be a little clever about this. And what we can do is we can take this plus that's part of this exponent. And we could think of this as being the multiplication of another base E to that ln of 280 power. What that's going to do is allow that 280 just to simply become a coefficient out in front of our e to the negative 4 fifteenths t power. It's definitely looking a little bit better. As far as the absolute values, do we keep them? Do they go away? Do you put a negative on the other side? A lot of times you look for your initial condition to make that call. When that initial condition has that value of zero that's neither negative or positive, it's a little bit tricky. So what I would suggest is we kind of cross our fingers a little bit. Let's go ahead and get rid of those absolute values. And then I'll show you how you can verify if you're going to be on the right track. So if I did not put a negative on that right side, and if indeed t was 0 and l were 0, do I get a true statement? Well, if l is 0, the left side's 280. If t is 0, the right side is 280. I think we did the right thing. We don't want to put a negative sign here because it's going to cause us to have an incorrect answer. And then by the time you subtract 280 over to the other side and divide by negative 2, I'm not going to show you the inner details of that particular step, but your L or L of T, if you dress him up in his Sunday best clothes, is going to look something like this. 140 minus 140 E to the negative 4 fifteenths T. And it turns out we're going to use that in a subsequent part of this problem, which happens to be right now. For time 0 to 30 minutes, cars will enter the parking garage at a rate modeled by E of t. So we've got this brand new, fairly ugly looking function, E of t. Thank you for that, Brian. But notice we have calculator 
assistance on this particular question. So it doesn't really matter how bad that E of T is, we can use our calculator. And we're going to use our solution from part B, and we're going to find the number of cars in the parking garage at time 15. This is your very classic rate in, rate out kind of problem. You could think about deciding that, well, if I want to make a new function that stands for the number of cars, maybe I could call it C, C of T. Well, what is C of T? Well, it's just simply the number of cars in the garage at time T, right? Well, that's great, but I need more than that, right? I need some official, some type of uh, an expression that's going to get the job done. So if you start C of T, you have to think about the beginning of time. And the beginning of time is right here. At time zero, what do we know about the number of cars in the garage? Now, it's been a while since we've read this, but it all goes back to the stem and the problem. At time zero, there are 435 cars in that garage. So that's what we want to start with. That's our base number. All right. Hey, we don't know why there's 435 cars in the garage at time zero. There just are. Now what we're going to do is figure out how many cars entered the garage. Now, if you think back to a previous uh, part of a, a problem that we had talked about earlier, to get the total amount, you just integrate the rate. And here we have it. We have our model for the rate that cars enter the garage. So all we have to do is add some more cars to that. Starting at time zero, we'll go up to T and we'll take that integral of E of, and I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. I'm going to write X. Well, there's different camps that say, well, really the variable that you have here should be a dummy variable and not match that upper boundary. But to be honest, it really doesn't make any difference for a variety of reasons. T's and X's look an awfully lot alike to an AP reader, and therefore we often overlook them. So you can do really whatever you want. If you put T's here, it's still going to make sense. If you want to use some dummy variable, that will work as well. I would just stay away from E and maybe C and maybe L. <laughs> so what are we going to do next? Well, we have the number of cars that are now entering the garage. We have to take into consideration the number of cars that have left. And that's where your part B answer comes in, because all of that work that you just did will tell you the number of cars that are leaving. Remember that differential equation that we had at the beginning? That model up here, this was our cars that exit. Now we have a function L for the cars that have exited. We went from a rate of which cars exited to an amount. Now, to wrap it up, you just simply let T be 15, and you grab your favorite calculator, and you just very carefully input this, and you should get an answer. Now, as far as which calculator model, well, I'm going to show you uh, a TI Inspire, and I know most of you watching might very well use the TI-84, so I'll give you a little bit of hints about how you would do this on the TI-84. So here is my calculator, and you'll notice that I've already uh, taken the liberty of defining those two functions, right? I have the L of T, which is the number of cars that leave at time T, and then I have E of T, which is the rate at which they enter the parking lot right, or the parking garage. Those of you using a T84 will very likely input these into your Y1 and Y2 menu. You're definitely going to be using the variable X instead of T. That doesn't make any difference. And you're going to basically do the same things that I'm going to do, just pretty much hitting some different buttons. So what do we have? Well, if you remember, we start off with 435 cars, and then we are going to add the integral of our E, right, from 0 to 12, um, I'm sorry, 0 to 15. And so I would hit Shift Plus to do that on the Inspire. Those of you using the 84 are going to hit your lucky combination Math 9. Here's our 0 to 15. I'm going to type in my E. It does not have to be capitalized. But notice the calculator understands it because it's bold there with respect to T. Let's get out of that differential. And then I think we're going to subtract. And now we just type in L. Now, those of you, again, using the 84, you're going to access your um, function names uh, by using your alpha button to get Y1 and Y2 on your screen. 
okay, boy, if this works, cross my fingers, if this works, we should get our correct answer. And the answer is about 398.064 cars. That's kind of fun. Could, could you have 0 0.064 cars? What is that, a tire? Well, don't worry so much about that. The problem didn't say to round. It's likely that it could say round to the nearest car. If it does, obey that. But if it doesn't, just go ahead and leave it the way it is and don't lose any points for a, um, uh, a misrepresented decimal. Brian, let's turn it back to you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we're going to take a look at just a couple of multiple choice questions here to kind of wrap us up. Uh, and then Tony's going to come back and give us a couple of uh, finalized tips and strategies involving differential equations and uh, logistic uh, equations as well. So there is a part D on that problem. It's a nice minimum problem. One of the really big uh, topics in the exam, you see those uh, rate and rate out problems, they ask you for a minimum amount or a maximum amount. That's a big point getter on most on most exams. So uh, definitely take a look at that part D and use that sort of weird kind of equation using differential equation with a, a rate equation and see how that plays out. So we're going to look at a couple of fast multiple choice questions because we want to highlight a couple more things involving logistic equations because that's like the BC part of differential equations. And so uh, a rumor is spreading that, oh, <laughs> all right. So uh, I guess I have a little bit of a confession to make. Um, when I wrote this problem last week or so, I kind of just put this as a filler in there. I told Tony I was going to go back and change it. I was just kind of like writing something and then I was going to go back and change the context. And I just forgot, literally for the first time, I'm kind of flustered. Uh, I literally didn't even think about it till right now. Um, I wasn't going to keep Trevor Packer's name in there, but I did. So if I'm not on the air tomorrow, uh, you know why. But uh, I've met Trevor a couple of times and he's an incredibly nice guy, uh, incredibly passionate about you students and you having opportunities to earn college credit. And so, uh, I'll keep his name in there and see what happens. But a rumor is spreading that I apparently started right now on live television, uh, YouTube, that Trevor is going to be joining Tony and I, uh, not true, uh, for a guest appearance on AP Live, not true. Uh, but the total number of people that have heard the rumor are, and thousands at time T hours, is going to follow a logistic model. Which of the following could be the logistic differential equation for the rate that the rumor is spreading at time T? So the key word here is just understanding we're looking for this logistic differential equation. So as soon as something tells you it's logistic, we kind of remember, hopefully remember that form that was in that beginning uh, slide. That's why Tony said, take a picture of this because there's two ways you might see it on the exam, but they're both differential equations that are logistic. And what should you look out for? Number one, when you do exponential growth problems, the key is the derivative is only with respect to the y value, right? Like a, a just a generic differential equation that's exponential might be something like dy over dt equals just k times y. Notice you've got a y in the problem, but you don't have a t. You don't have the x as part of the derivative. That the, the rate that's changing depends solely on the amount and not the, the time or anything. Well, logistic, you saw that picture earlier, it starts off exponential, right? Logistic curves, the solutions kind of start off exponential but then they get hampered by something. So about that halfway point of the carrying capacity, they start to like not continue to grow up at the same rate and they hit that carrying capacity, but they have this exponential piece in the beginning. And then over time, there's this carrying capacity that forces it uh, to not continue growing at that same exponential rate. So just like with exponential functions, logistics are only in terms of the Y variables. So a quick way to immediately check whether a differential equation could be logistic if you start seeing any variables with T in it or X in it, right? That could never be logistic. Logistic will always be in terms of Y. Notice that we have, the difference is we have Y twice, right? Notice in front, that's that KY piece. That's that exponential part that it starts off. And then the other piece at the end, this is what's hampering it from continuing that same path. And so just having KY there would be exponential but having the other component is what sort of brings it back to logistic. And so immediately we can eliminate choice A, B, and C, because every one of those had T in there, right? So I'm only left with one option that has only the Y values or R values in this case, and it's D. So how do I, now we kind of do it by elimination, right? It's only, only choice, it's possible, but how would I know? Well, they took this equation on the right, and if we were to like distribute right, this problem, because normally you see it factored, but you can distribute it. If I distributed this, you're going to get something, I'll call it like A, I don't know what it is, but something times Y and then minus something else 
times y squared, right? K y times L is just something times y, and then minus K y times y is just something times y squared. So one of the things you might look out for a logistic problem, if it's not uh, already factored for you, is you're going to have that y term first, and then you're going to have that y squared term second. That's what we have. We have our r here, and then minus our r squared second. So maybe some other choices might have r squared first, and then r second. That wouldn't quite work out. So there might be some different twists they throw for the wrong answers, but you're looking for that same connection. So in this case, it has to be just d. And then I wanted to show one more quick multiple choice before I throw it back to Tony. And I might not go totally in depth on this. I might go a little bit quick, but I want you to go back and try it. I just want to point something out. Um, and we're going through two of these multiple choice questions. And there's going to be three more, obviously, that you could go back and do on your own besides question four. So question four, we have this differential logistic equation. dy dx equals 6y, 1 minus y over 20. And we know that f of 4 equals 10. Find the limit. Oh, man. Did I just sneak L'Hopital's in here? Of course I did. So my favorite thing to do is just sneak L'Hopital questions into anything I can. Uh, so we see a limit. It's multiple choice, but if we were doing L'Hopital's question on the FRQ, it's really important that you write the numerator and denominator as separate limits to check the conditions. And we would say the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator. And we would evaluate those two things individually. We don't want to ever write down on a paper something equals zero over zero. Zero over zero isn't even a number. And if you say something equals zero over zero, and then later on, you're like, my answer is four, then you're like, oh, by the way, zero over zero is four. That doesn't make any sense, right? We have this linkage errors uh, with what you write down. So what we should do is just evaluate the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom individually at x equals four. Well, f of four I know is 10. That's given to me in the problem. And then four times four is obviously 16. And then plus six gives me zero. So the limit of the numerator was zero. Then we're going to evaluate the bottom. And we have to make some connections here, right? We know that uh, we're finding f prime. Well, y equals f of x is our equation. So f prime is the dy dx, right? So we're trying to find dy dx at x equals four. But we have to be careful because notice our dy dx equation doesn't have any x's in it. It's in terms of y. And so if you just start plugging four into everything, you're going to you know, go too quick and make a mistake. We're plugging a y value in. So we know that when x is 4, the y value should be 10. That's why that information was there. So our dy dx is going to end up being, what is that f prime? It's going to be 6 times 10 and then times the quantity 1 minus 10 over 20 and then minus 2 times 4 squared, 2x squared, plus 2. Spoiler alert, 1 minus 10 halves or 10 over 20 is a half times 10 times 6 is 30. That ends up being 30. And then minus 32. And then plus 2. And guess what we get? 0. That 0 over 0 in determinate form is what allows us to use L'Hopital's rule. So if we use L'Hopital's theorem here, then we know now that the limit, I'm going to kind of write this right here, the limit is going to be the derivative of the numerator. So we get this f prime of x minus 4 on the top. And then in the bottom, f prime becomes f double prime. And then we're going to get minus 4x. And we're going to try it again. And we just figured out f prime. We just did that right here. So I'm not going to redo all that work. I know that this is 30. So the numerator becomes 30 minus 4. But in the denominator, now we have the second derivative. So what are we going to do? Are we going to take this thing's derivative from scratch and do all this extra work? You could. But because it's logistic, did you catch that? Like the second derivative? Well, look at the original problem. The carrying capacity is 20. Remember, if you recognize on a logistic problem, that denominator there, that, that 20, that's your carrying capacity. And so here, the y value is 10 when x is 4, which is half of the carrying capacity. And we know that when you reach half the carrying capacity, you're at that moment. You're at that point of inflection on the graph. You're at that moment when the second derivative becomes zero for an instant, right? So at the halfway point, the concavity switches, which means the second derivative in this case must have been zero. And we end up getting zero there minus 16. So we get 26 over negative 16, a little bit reducing, and you get negative 13 over eight. Thanks for Tony for catching my mistake on my answer key earlier where I didn't have the right answer on there and we fixed it before you got it. But uh, we get A for that problem. So again, knowing those properties of 
logistics could save you some time. So Tony is going to wrap us up and he's going to go through, again, what are the really big things for logistics that you have to know? And then don't forget, like, you don't have to integrate logistics. It's fun to do it because it lets you do some partial fraction ideas, but nothing on the AP exam will make you use the general solution to a logistic. It'll give you a differential equation and you might have to recognize the properties of where it's growing the fastest, where it changes signs uh, and those kind of ideas. So Tony will bring back uh, just a couple more tips for us and hopefully you feel better about these problems and you can crush it on the exam. Tony? So what should we take away? Well, as Brian said, we've got some you know, main ideas here with logistics that really are going to drive where you're going to get the points. Number one, be ready for a contextual differential equation problem on the free response. It could be anything from uh, some of the things that you saw here with, with tests being uploaded to cars perhaps being parked, just some kind of real world situation. Just be prepared for it and fight your way through the calculus. Don't get overburdened by the context. You guys know what's going on. Like Brian said, for logistics, you will not be asked to solve the differential equation. You probably have the ability to do it. It's likely going to involve partial fraction decomposition, uh, but it's probably a little bit rougher version of that. We'll give you an easier version of partial fractions on the test elsewhere, likely. So you're going to be fine. Just go ahead and, and uh, ignore the fact that you're going to have to solve any logistic. Certainly, as we talked about the opening uh, of the broadcast, that opening slide with all of the information in that table, understand those two general forms of the logistic differential equation, because you could see either one of them. And then of course, for logistics, know those connections between the carrying capacity, the growth rate, and the concavity. That opening slide is your one-stop shop for all things logistic. As always, we thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, we know it's been a tough year for you. We really believe that Brian and I are, are among two of your best cheerleaders. We want you to do so well on this AP exam. AP calculus, whether it's AB or BC, is really a combination of not just what you do in one year, but it's so many years of mathematics. Think about all the amount of work that you've put in, not just this year, but all of the years leading up to this moment, these next few weeks before you take the exam. We know you can do it. We're so confident in your abilities. We just want you to keep pushing hard, believe in yourself, don't give up, and you can certainly succeed. Tune in tomorrow. We're going to talk about all of our favorite subject, the convergence tests. Yay. So we're going to get kind of a, a revisit of series. And so we uh, certainly hope to see you around for that. We look forward to it as always. As always, thank you very much. Keep working. We'll see you next time.